Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Grow Asia Digital Learning Series event of 2021. Uh, my name is Wei Li, and I'm the Innovation Lead at Grow Asia. Um, we are a nonprofit organization and multi stakeholder platform catalyzed by the World Economic Forum and the ASEAN Secretariat. And we aim to facilitate multi stakeholder collaboration in inclusive and sustainable agricultural development in Southeast Asia. Um, in particular, we are focused on improving smallholder farmers' livelihoods, and we hope that through events such as this one, um, that we can bring together a community of practice across private, public, and development sectors that will facilitate meaningful partnerships. Um, I would like to thank our primary donors, uh, Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, whose support makes this event possible. And I would also like to thank Adam, JQ, and the Padang team, who have worked with Grow Asia really closely over the past few years to grow the smallholder agritech ecosystem here in Singapore. Um, Adam will be taking us through the smallholder agritech Southeast Asia landscape 2021 and sharing with us insights from data gathered as well as from some conversations we have had with our agribusiness partners. And of course, thanks to our two startup founders, Vanessa and Rasarin, who will be sharing with us their view from the ground. After that, we will have a 30 minute panel discussion and Q&A. So please do type your questions into the Q&A box as we go along. Uh, so just a few housekeeping keeping items before we start. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, please go ahead and type it into the question box, which uh, since we're using Zoom webinar is separate from the chat box where I can see you guys already uh, talking to each other. And if you have a specific speaker who you would like to answer your question, go ahead and just uh, write their name in your, in your question as well. If you have any technical issues with the Zoom platform, uh, please reach out to my colleague Pranav uh, at pranav at growasia.org. And uh, we will also be recording this webinar and we will send you the recording after the session together with our newsletter. And uh, it will also be posted on the DLS uh, web page. Um, and so with that, uh, let me launch a poll. Oops. <laughs> yes, uh, we would just like to get a sense of uh, where everyone is based. Uh, we see over 100 people uh, have signed in, over 120 people have signed in. And it's always nice to get a sense of where um, everyone is calling in from. So I will just give you like a few more seconds and I'll end the poll. So it looks like a really great spread, of course, a little bit more from Singapore than everywhere else. but. Really great to see um, representation from all over ASEAN. And wow, one fifth of you guys are from outside of ASEAN as well. Great. Um, did I share the results? Yes, can you see the results? Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, um, Pranav, could you launch the second poll as well? Just to get a sense of what um, type of organization you're from. It's always good to um, have a sense of who's in the room as well. Uh, whether you're a startup, investor, corporate development organization, government or other. Give you guys a few seconds as well. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have a really great mix uh, about a quarter over about a quarter of you are startups, a quarter from the uh, nonprofit or development sector. And then we have a mix of investors, corporate and some government folks as well on the call. So thank you for participating. And with that, let me hand over the floor to Adam Lyle, uh, co-founder and executive chairman of Padang & Co an open innovation catalyst that works with corporate and government partners to drive sustainable growth and create positive impact in verticals, including uh, food and agriculture, health, uh, sustainability, and smarter cities. They also run four innovation labs in Singapore with various corporate uh, and ecosystem partners, including Level 3, uh, in partnership with Unilever Foundry. Uh, over to you, Adam. Thanks, Wei Li, for such a nice introduction. Uh, and thank you for your help in putting together the landscape along with uh, JQ, my colleague here at Padang and Eason, uh, over the last uh, week. It, it's definitely our pleasure. This is the third uh, time that uh, we've done this. So it's exciting to create something that's got legs and it's fascinating watching the growth uh, over the last couple of years. So let's get into it. 
Okay, uh, I'm not going to speak long about COVID. We all know that COVID's been with us and it has had many impacts. But what I want to just comment and the numbers here you can see on the screen, of course, it's been an acceleration for digital uh, across the world and also in Southeast Asia. Just look at the number of new internet users last year, 40 million, that's extraordinary. Approximately 20 to 25 million of those, as I've seen, are in Indonesia. Uh, the number of people, you know, one in three started their services uh, during this time. And importantly, there's a view that people are going to continue. Uh, and again, just getting another sense of what does this mean in a digital context and how people have changed their behaviours. E-growth, so look at the uh, deal activity there, up 165%. Uh, and you know the numbers are big. 64% um, of the five billion estimated in e growth are uh, ASEAN and Asian. Uh, so huge numbers. So that's kind of the digital perspective of what's been happening. I want to jump back um, a little bit and just look at some of the other factors that are hitting the marketplace. And we hadn't sort of really done this before, but it just occurred to me we needed to sort of step back and have a look across a couple of different um, areas. And what am I talking about here? So let's start from the left with the overall system. I think we are all adopting a greater systems uh, thinking approach to agriculture and its role. And for food really, of course, is at the center of so many things. And when we're looking at the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which at Padang we're passionate about, as is Grow Asia, if we just zero in and focus in on food, we really can make a huge impact on transforming and achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. So a lot more people are looking at food from that point of view. So we've got a different uh, perspective coming into it. And of course, in the last year, we've seen fractured supply chains. How do we deal with that? How do we change that? So again, there's a lot of things happening in the background. It's not just the digital numbers that we've seen, lots of other impacts. And of course, sustainability. I think during 2020, a lot of people thought, listen, people are not focusing on the SDGs to the same degree because there was so much else to focus on. But they are absolutely now. Uh, food tech. Now, we're looking at agri, but the whole buzz around food tech has impact on the entire supply chain. So all these factors are happening in the background. With people, we're continuing to see the issue with aging farmers. What does that mean? And most excitingly, we're seeing a lot of focus on the role of women in agriculture. And I just saw a report from, uh, again, the Australian government uh, talking about investment in women in agriculture and the returns that it's yielding. So this is a fantastic uh, recognition that we need to be doing a lot more for women in agriculture and the returns that we'll be getting. And the role of agripreneurs continues to come as more, in some ways, we're seeing younger people come back uh, and focus on the opportunities. Likewise, there's a lot going on in the events in the hub space. WF um, has launched uh, food innovation hubs, including ASEAN. Just next door to us here in Singapore, uh, Nongsa Digital Park at Batam. Great government to government relationships, great opportunities to focus on the digital tech there for people wanting to land in Singapore for instance, and get easy access to Indonesia to do piloting, that's next door. WEF coming to Singapore in August, big focus on sustainability, and in that there'll be more agriculture. The FAO Summit on Food Systems in November of this year in Italy. Lots of things focusing on this industry. And of course, finance, it's always a kind of follow the money. Well, we're seeing a lot of activity in the payment space in FinTech. Uh, it's not impacting directly smallholder farmers as yet, but watch this space. NFTs, the craziness going on in there. What might be the impact of, the, of NFTs when we start to look at different ways uh, to um, examine ownership in, in different focuses? And of course, green finance, big focus continuing. How will we finance the infrastructure? Exciting developments there and impact investing. We've seen enormous sums uh, raised uh, to Masik here in Singapore recently.
recently uh, partnered with Leapfrog with a $500 million investment in impact investing. Impact investing is going to the trillions. It's going to drive a lot of the change that so many of us want to see. But just following the money again, looking at the next slide uh, from our friends at Ag Funder, uh, they really cut some of the data just to look at Southeast Asia. A uh, number of deals and investment. We, we can see, yes, the number of deals was slightly off in 2020, but that asterisk uh, points out um, that these numbers are, are as around the third quarter. So we'll see these numbers go up. Importantly, uh, these are not just on smallholder funds. I must emphasize, but the, the trend, as you can see, continue to go to go up. And that number of 700 million will be higher uh, when these numbers are recut. So a lot of activity, which is very exciting. Mo moving on, before we jump into the startups this year, we just wanted, we'd had some conversations recently with some of our corporate partners. And I think it's uh, interesting uh, to see what's happening in MNC land, if you will, uh, across a couple of different corporates. Olam, uh, many of you will have read, have uh, recently uh, launched Jiva in Indonesia. Now, this is a result of a venture build that they've done with BS. G, uh, digital ventures. They've been working on this over the last uh, 12 months based on um, experience where they've been operating Olam Direct uh, over the last uh, years. Building on that experience and the lessons from there, uh, they're building our Jiva in Indonesia. A very exciting development. Uh, uh, and just a couple of comments there. It's looking at transactions. And one of the learnings has been how that's building trust. Uh, people trust who they're transacting with. So an interesting way is we want to build on these lessons. Another one that I uh, took out of our conversation with uh, Suresh the other day was around the role of the micro entrepreneur, a new job that they've created, the people that are bringing the farmers on to the system, doing the KYC. Again, it's really important how we're getting people on board. Yara is looking uh, again from they've build it, been building their digital uh, platform for some years. Uh, they've now really sort of uh, gone ahead greatly in the last little while, uh, adding some uh, 3 million users over four countries. Um, focus very much again, I think, on an online, offline approach, which is really key. You can't just be online. Uh, I think it's really important to remember that. One of their exciting developments is uh, with Telenor. Uh, they, they managed to add 200,000 people over a two month period with uh, Telenor. Now, I think that's really interesting because that focuses on the power of telcos. And again, they're looking forward to the next stage of development uh, in e-commerce and digital payments. Closer to home to us here at uh, level three with our uh, friends at Unilever and MUFG, um, they've come together looking at uh, the, the Bango Soy Source product and building it out as a supply chain using technology so that they are able to better understand um, demand and supply uh, so that they have greater awareness uh, of what's happening in the field so that they can predict the future. And again, really important, the role of farm coordinators. So just a couple of um, sort of skating over the top of some of the activities that the corporates are doing, how they're really getting very involved in building out these systems they've been growing for the last couple of years. Now, stepping to the next, we'll start to look at what's been happening uh, on the startup side of things. So uh, some of you may remember this. This is our model uh, from last year, and it's kind of the problem map. Pretty self-explanatory. We're lacking a lot of things, it's whether it's information, access to markets, financial services, quality imports, or access to machines and labor. That's the, the, the set of problems. And then uh, we look at how we might solve those. And these particular uh, business business models that Grow Asia uh, released a report on uh, last year, which I think is you know, great for you to look at across these five different uh, business models, farmer advisory, peer-to-peer -peer lending, traceability, digital marketplaces, and, and uh, mechanization platforms. Now these then map across to the problems that you've just seen. And so as you can see, trace, traceability there, digital markets is, uh, 
uh, tops off two of them, um, while each of the others are, are focused on, on one particular area. So we've got a nice lineup of problem and solution business model. And so that's the lens that uh, we've been using uh, to go through. Now, one of the things that we have done this year was with Pharma Advisory, uh, there are enormous number of startups in the Pharma Advisory space. So uh, JQ and the team uh, dived in to take a closer look to see how might we um, divide these up and understand uh, how many in each category. Um, now, pest and disease, really important. Uh, Internet of things, each of them, uh, uh, of the companies in this space uh, are touching typically um, at least a one, uh, if not more of these particular uh, features. Um, and we're see seeing them all um, develop. Now there's a mix as you can see there between delivery uh, mechanisms, as well as what the activity is. But Pharma Advisory, as you'll see in the next slide, is still a very dominant part of what people are focusing on. Now, just getting a, a sense, um, we say it's small, but it's a growing ecosystem. Yeah, 163 is up quite sharply from last year, uh, if you're comparing last year's report. But I have to provide the caveat that some of the companies that have been added in this year were operating last year, uh, but we had not discovered them. Some were operating in stealth some were just not easy to find. And as you know, in this space, getting information is not always um, so easy. The actual uh, new companies last year was a little bit slower, but what you can see there, which I'm really excited about, is the number of investors, 89 investors we've been able to track down. And as you know, if the investment is there, then we can start to see many more solutions being financed to solve the many problems that we're wanting to take on. And the ecosystem enablers, uh, people like uh, ourselves out there, there's a good solid number across the region, but uh, I always believe that we can need more and encouraging more people to come in and match make, connect people to help solve the many problems. Just sort of diving a bit more uh, into giving you a sense of what does this look like? Now, uh, I hope you can see it on the screen. What we did this year, we've actually squeezed all of them onto one slide. Last year, uh, we just gave a um, representation, uh, but this year um, we've got them all in on one slide. Now, as you know, uh, the numbers will change. The be new companies today and somebody may um, fold or be acquired or things will change. Now, you'll see down here again, Farmer Advisory, that's where lots of them are. Mechanization platforms, there's quite a few there, but uh, I must say this covers also drones and drones do uh, account for a large number of the mechanization platform uh, companies. Just to uh, give you a sense there, um, most of those numbers do relate uh, to drone, drones. Um, I'm excited to see traceability uh, building up peer-to-peer um, -peer lending as well, digital marketplaces, um, more coming to bear there. So we'll go through into a little bit more um, detail and just give you um, a sense of how they line up. Um, so 58, Farmer Advisory, clear winner, but you know, and again, as it's a growing market, 58 to 40, it's not a competition. It's just trying to get a sense of where are people um, focusing. Uh, so these numbers, as you can see, uh, as of March, they're, they're not uh, too dramatically different to last year. As I said before, the actual formation of new companies uh, was less uh, than uh, perhaps one would have hoped, but not so surprising uh, given the conditions we were seeing. Now, just moving through, now, Indonesia is a clear winner in terms of uh, the number. Uh, it's uh, the, the more mature marketplace. And of course, we know that many people are focusing on Indonesia, both internally, uh, the agri-food ecosystem is growing uh, uh, quite dramatically. And of course, other companies from outside are being attracted by the activity that, and the sheer size of Indonesia. Singapore, again, 
Um, some people, if you've joined this for the first time, might be surprised to see so many in Singapore, not knowing for our, our agriculture, but certainly Singapore is known as a great place to, as a landing pad for people to set up companies, uh, to raise funds, uh, and also we're so, so close to the rest of the markets and of course as I said before Indonesia is literally next door Malaysia etc so a great place for company formation but it's great to see Philippines and um, Vietnam Malaysia all and, and Thailand it still surprises me um, Thailand's a little lower than you would expect I'll have to say Day. Again, it might be um, that uh, sometimes trying to uh, find the Thai companies, uh, we may not always discover all of them, but we're certainly discovering um, the most notable. So um, then if we take a, an, another look at try to get a sense of, okay, I was talking about some of the ecosystem players and activities. We, we are seeing more acceleration programs come into the marketplace and, and challenges. It's not growing dramatically, but again, um, the last 12 months, we've certainly seen a lot more online activities, but overall, um, uh, it hasn't grown as much. Uh, plug and play certainly added uh, an activity uh, over the last 12 months. So I would expect that we'll see more coming on board uh, in uh, 2021 um, and uh, certainly with uh, Grow, our friends at uh, Grow, not to be confused with Grow Asia, uh, will be uh, launching a number of programs this year. The Singapore Food Bowl, which was very popular last year, um, is um, back on uh, and their next cohort um, is uh, will be announced um, shortly. So uh, still very active, just not lots of new players. Now, the money, what does it look like? Where has it uh, been going? Now, if you do look back at last year, you might think, oh, the numbers um, are not that different. The number last year was actually talking about money raised to date, um, whereas this number is the money raised in 2020. Uh, last year, it was around about 70 million to date. This year, we've raised and tracked 55 million. Now, this is for smallholder agri-tech as we've identified it. If somebody perhaps is in uh, Southeast Asia, but um, have raised the money outside, we're not putting them in these numbers. So again, uh, where's the money going? You can see it's digital marketplaces, uh, more than farmer advisory. Um, so those two are definitely uh, getting the lion's share. Peer-to-peer, -peer, we didn't see any uh, traceability undisclosed. And mechanization, sadly, um, also uh, didn't raise a great deal of money over the last 12 months. So again, not surprisingly, given that most activity is in Indonesia, that's where we're seeing uh, most of um, the money. Um, there wasn't a lot raised in Singapore in this space um, last year. Now, again, uh, we'll be confirming some of these numbers, getting detailed numbers. A lot of companies don't actually disclose. Um, so unless we're going um, into company records, we're not always getting right to all the numbers. So Indonesia powering along and see Thailand there with the raises that they are doing, although there might be so many numbers, the numbers are quite high in the raise. Now, the top raises, big surprise, uh, the, the three of them in Indonesia. Uh, e fishery tiny hub and chili belly and as you can see very sizable uh raises uh series b a and a um and again digital marketplaces two digital marketplaces and farmer advisory so that gives you a sense of how the numbers are playing out uh keeping watch on my time here i'm sorry if i'm going quickly but um, so, some notables uh, here, um, as you can see, uh, Golden Gate and Open Space, both um, investing in Tony Hub, uh, wave maker in e-fishery. E uh, Open Space just recently uh, raised its third fund of 200 million. 200 million. This is pretty exciting because Open Space is a very keen agri-investor. And with that uh, level of war chest, 
uh, I think uh, it's a great omen for what we're going to see, the type of investments um, going forward. And typically, this is what we're seeing. Remember, I said 89 investors. We're seeing funds with huge uh, raises. So this augurs very well for the future. Now, just a quick few kind of predictions and takeaways and look at what we said last year, just in the final minutes. Uh, we we're, we're looking to, we were predicting that we we're going to see new business models emerge and and to that end um some of the types of activities we've seen from vietnam with uh poteco uh, a gamified uh, farm management app let's see how that plays out uh and from the philippines a digital learning uh platform which i think is really interesting uh tagani let's see how that um goes forward because we, we can see how that can complement many of the other activities. Uh, we also predict that we're going to see a $100 million round by 2023. We, we think we're on track with uh, the funds raised last year and also the trend. Uh, the trend is increasing each year. So we're pretty confident we're not pulling back from that. Um, that's pretty gutsy, but um, we think we're going to see a hundred million uh, round by 2023. Uh, more Indian agri-tech uh, into Southeast Asia. We perhaps haven't quite seen um, as much uh, this year as we might have expected, but uh, we, we do see how to, um, crop in raised 20 million uh, with uh, Tomasic via ABC World, uh, another impact investor. Uh, going into cropping. So um, we've taken a bit of Singapore into Indian agri-tech. And just in a sense, sort of takeaways and thoughts, uh, I definitely believe that what we're going to continue to see more of is the large MNCs, many of them not, uh, and the others that I didn't speak about, are doing a lot of work in developing um, their interactions and their platforms uh, for smallholder farmers. They've been working at it uh, and perhaps it takes some time, but they've got the scale, they've got the firepower and commitment to really make these platforms work. So a lot more to be heard of over the next 12 months from there. Sustainability, a passion of ours. I believe there's huge opportunities uh, for um, startups to be working uh, as people are looking much more closely at impact, at traceability issues. So a lot more coming in this space. And then there's a diverge between the um, marketplaces here between uh, people uh, buying product from the smallholder farmers and the smallholder farmers buying product from suppliers. We're seeing a lot more focus uh, the other uh, from the smallholder side uh, selling uh, rather than them buying. So how will this play out over time? How will those platforms mature and grow? And I guess a final thought is the, the role of fintech. No one's quite cracked it as yet, but we know there's huge demand. There's huge still unbanked smallholder farmers, mobile wallets, the rise of smartphones, I absolutely believe that the opportunity is there. It's hard, but to me, it's one of the greatest opportunities. And I would like to hope that with the huge amount of impact investing and these new investors, um, that they will be there to support and get these much needed funds uh, through new methods uh, to the smallholder farmers. So th thank you uh, for listening. You can uh, download this deck uh, once it's uploaded at uh, dls.growasia.org. And uh, I look forward to taking some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. And uh, now to go from the 10,000 meter view to the farm level view, uh, let me introduce Dr. Rasarin Chilachat Teranun the founder and CEO of Listen Field, a company that specializes in applying precision technology to improve agricultural productivity and sustainability. She received a PhD in engineering from Chib Chibu University in Nagoya, and her dissertation on API integration platforms from agronomic models has been incorporated into the agricultural reform policy of Japan. Over to you, Rasarin. Thank you very much. And it's always been nice to speaking at Croatia event. Uh, our startup, Listen Field, intend to use technology to improve quality of food and reduce farm operation costs in the way that is failure to the environment. We see the problem as ineffective 
on farm management and high operation costs that our technology can help. Can you go to the next slide, Pete? We provide a predictive modeling platform to provide insight from all key variables to understand plants, growth, produce, and reproduce to make the right decisions in order to improve productivity. And let me provide you with some example that our platform have been contributing to solve food and agriculture issues to smallholder farmers. Currently, we are working with rice and sugarcane farmers and mills in Thailand and in Vietnam. We help mills to reduce operation costs by providing actionable information to help the mills know the gross performance of individual field under their contract. We help them precisely estimate use information and sugar content to manage uh, supply and their meal. And for farmer, what farmer get from this service? Farmer also receive the rice advice based on their field performance and information that we analyze to support on the farm management and to really improve the production at precise location at the right time and at the right amount. This can help farmer to reduce the operation cost and at the same time, improve the productivity. And for the meal, they also receive the uh, good quality of rice and sugar cane. Next, please. And we at Listen feel firmly believe that API integration platform that we have developed could pay an important contribution to precision agriculture. It is the infrastructure that helps us connect data and deliver actionable data to our customers and the applications. It is a key to bridge the gap in utilizing deep technologies to the real field. It provides insight into the aspects that are most important for all plants and also their growth. Next slide, please. The first component that we put into our API integration platform and this information also contribute to application to all of stakeholders, including farmers, is the soil. We provide a soil fusion model that assess the soil profile down to 60 centimeters. This is being done everywhere, including Thailand and in Vietnam. The second is climate and weather conditions. For this, we use 30 years of climatological data as the benchmark. This weather pattern data is best for which we can more accurately predict seasonal weather conditions at precise location with the help of on-site sensors. This sensor not only monitor rainfall, but also moisture and other factors that are important for plant growth. So in short, our model will provide very detailed and timely data on climate conditions, as well as their outlook at precise location. And the third component is cultivar coefficient. This means that plants, each with their unique genotypes, will grow and reproduce differently in response to changing environment factors. The cultivar file that we put together can help tell our farmers and our customers about that plants are growing under prevailing conditions. And more importantly, we can also tell our farmers how their crops will turn out if they are fed differently or if the climate and soil condition change. Uh, next slide, please. And put all this together the, we can have a powerful platform to produce actionable data to our farmers. Uh, next slide, please. And on our platform, we also utilize 
the multispectral imaging technology from satellites to analyze crop health, crop performance, as well as like water stress and nitrogen stress, which is related to uh, input material use. This can help our farmers and our customers to understand their field performance and the factors to be improved that help to improve their productivity. And uh, next slide, please. Before I conclude my talk today, I would like to mention about one of the deep technology that right now we are developing, which we call a uh, genomic selection. This today might not be contribute to the small holder today, but we believe that with this technology will help us produce or reproduce the seed or the variety that be more useful for farmers, such as we can produce this seed tolerant seed, or we can produce a, the, the seed that can produce high protein content with uh, with the with the with this technology. This can help the seed company and the, the breeders accelerate the breeding process. And for this, for this technology, we have been working with Japanese government and several research organizations to provide genomic selection and GWAS prediction platform that help breeder and seed company to accelerate the process of breeding. And we also set up the breeding consortium in Japan. And now we are now uh, setting up some alliance with Thailand and Vietnam to promote this kind of technology that the first target for us is to breed the new variety for the seed tolerant, tolerant for uh, tapioca. And another one is another project that I want to introduce is that we are now working with Japan and India joint research collaboration to breed nitrogen efficiency try in a wheat um, and mess. Nitrogen con contamination is a servant issue, as all of us know. So if we can breed this new variety, which means that we can help to improve the productivity and at the same time, it can reduce the, the problem of uh, nitrogen contamination in our environment. Um, next slide, please. And we believe that our predictive modeling platform that helps stakeholders include smallholder farmers understand plant growth, produce, and reproduce, which, con which can contribute to create sustainability in food and farm. And now our platform are contributing to farmers and stakeholders in Japan, Vietnam, Thailand, India, and also in some part of the US. And with the collaboration with Kubota, which one of our stake, the stake of this field, we believe that we can expand precision agriculture solution for farmers, not only in Thailand, but in Southeast Asia region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rasarin. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Vanessa, uh, Dr. Vanessa Teo, uh, the founder and CEO of Agrom IQ, an agri-tech solutions company that enables farmers to achieve quality certification and access to new markets. Uh, she received a PhD in high performance computing from the University of Brunei Darussalam and specialized in rice crop modeling and agricultural systems management. Um, over to you, Vanessa. Thank you for the introduction, Lily. Hi everyone, um, thanks for being here for today's um, event for this digital learning series. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, what I'll go through is basically a little introduction about the company and a little bit of uh, my background. So we are Agrom IQ. Uh, we focus on empowering farmers and building communities. 
So I left some information over here. Okay, so um, next. Next. So yeah, just um, a little bit about my background. I um, basically studied um, biology and microbiology at Imperial College and a master's in environmental engineering. And then yeah, with my work experience in uh, my PhD, I spent about four to five years uh, collecting data on smallholder farmers in Southeast Asia, collected uh, farms to setting up weather stations, um, surveying farmers in Vietnam, Thailand, and in Brunei as well, as part of the research group that we had developed with IBM Research Lab in Brunei. And then I launched the startup in Brunei under the Dar es Salaam Enterprise Program 100 Day Startup Bootcamp in early 2017, where we raised about angel investment of $150,000. Um, and then later on, preceding years, raised a pre series A from a in, um, Serana Capital, a Singaporean VC firm. So next, please. So I guess, you know, everyone here definitely, you know, has the idea or the impression that we, there is a need to secure food for us globally. And definitely everyone knows that by 2050, food production will just have to increase by 70% just to be able to hit the demand that's going to be um, needed then. But I think in terms of food security and how I look at it or how we look at it here in Agrome is that food security is about sufficiency, safety, and the nutritional value in food. So we look at it in a holistic approach and basically how do we ensure that um, us as consumers are basically as well consuming the right kind of food. And currently in the Asian uh, farming landscape, um, estimated there are about 73 million farmers in ASEAN and definitely due to decline in the aging workforce and no one really entering the industry, there definitely is a depletion of resources entering, especially in the human labor side. And focusing on food quality and safety, there's huge challenges um, on the ground up because there are so many farmers today that are not able to integrate best practices that leads to a lot of issues down the supply chain, leading to about 150 million foodborne illnesses and 175,000 deaths annually in ASEAN. All of these kind of data that is uh, very relevant to exactly what Agrom is trying to um, support or solve. Next, please. So in terms of, I guess, um, where we see the real issues are and where the underlying problems we see with smallholder farmers is that due to the small size in these small farmers, the yield are definitely low. And not only that, the challenges that they face are just a variety from you know, getting more difficult weather conditions, lack of resources, lack of information, and just the lack of ability to integrate better practices. Due to all of this, they definitely have um, lower ROI that results in also lower bargaining power. They don't have enough volume to supply the bigger chain. And at the same time, they also don't have enough volume to you know, um, basically bargain a better deal when it comes to the buyers, which is only a limited few when you come to think about uh, directly on the field. So these are the current issues that we've really tried to define, especially when we work with our smallholder farmers. Next, please. So what, do, what does Agrom do today? We basically help um, our farmers make better decisions, maybe uh, from technical training that provides them the information they need to really improve their practices and providing them with market solutions that really focuses on farm quality and farm ROI. Next, please. So this is um, generally um, a journey uh, with our farmers. So initially, we set them up with a farm profile, um, either digitally, meaning with our mobile app, or with basic uh, record keeping or um, physical forms that really set up their profile with us. With these profiles, we actually create different kinds of uh, farmer profiles. And based on these profiles, we actually divert them to different resources that will allow us to actually support them better. And through these um, onboarding sessions, we then lead on to our farm training sessions. We conduct um, farm training sessions from certification training as well to basic uh, farm practices such as fertilizer mixing and things like that and farm grading when it comes to their own uh, products. 
right now in Brunei, we are the only um, company to be awarded the um, certification, um, certification training body for good agricultural practices, which really allows us to improve the quality of farmers um, as a whole. Definitely in terms of the variety of farmers, there are many kinds and they are all struggling in different areas. What we believe with this GAP certification, it just elevates them to hit uh, a baseline threshold that will then allow them to integrate better practices, you know, either integration of technology or other practices that will further improve. So through the GAP certification, we elevate them to an average baseline and then from there target them towards other resources that could benefit their farms. Um, today, we're definitely focused a lot more on distribution and marketplaces. Um, later on, I can share you a little bit more on that, but due, um, post, um, I guess due to COVID, that really uh, caused us to pivot our business and the way that we were working and our plans for the next 18 months, 24 months, into how we're building the business changed. And then we definitely focused more into distribution channels, working with B2B clients and B2C um, clients as well. Next, please. So for everyone here who, uh, who may not know uh, what the agricultural, uh, agricultural GAP certification is, there's something that's developed by the ASEAN GAP Secretariat, which really focuses um, on building a holistic approach in terms of helping smallholder farmers improve. And there are four major prongs, which focuses on economic viability, environmental sustainability, social acceptability, and food safety and quality. In terms of the GAP certification, it provides enormous benefits for the farmers in terms of not only elevating their farm process, but it actually allows them to sell um, to higher value markets. And especially across ASEAN borders, we are able to move products way faster with GAP certified products. And for consumers, they are just safe in the knowledge that the products that they're consuming are safer for them and has gone through the vetting uh, process. And at the, end, at the end of the day for retailers, is this ability to harmonize trade and facilitate trade within um, the ASEAN region and beyond. Next, please. So this is just um, a little snapshot of our journey as a startup. We started off as a farm management app um, back in 2017, where we really focused on onboarding farmers and basically creating all um, their farm record profiles. So through that, we learned a lot about farming, um, the farming ecosystem. And from there, we developed an uh, integrated agricultural curriculum into schools, not only into educational in institutes, vocational training schools, but also into primary schools where we teach children about the basics of farming to ensure that they actually understand the processes involved as well. And for the first two years of the business, it was really about creating awareness about what we were trying to do and change of mindset. So we were able to really integrate this um, curriculum. And from there, we were recognized by the Brunei government, um, hence being awarded the sole certification body and training company for Brunei GAP. That just opened us up to the full um, database of farmers, 5,000 farmers in Brunei. And then again, we were awarded by BIM Iaga region to be the digitizing platform for BGAP. Uh, for farmers who would be interested to get the certification. And 2019, we raised our pre-series A with Serana Capital, an FMB-focused business, which we felt was a good synergy in terms of market access opportunities for the future for our farmers. And then we were working uh, towards expansion in Indonesia early January 2020 with our local partner, which we identified through the Bimpiaga Network. We were able to onboard 2,000 farmers in Banyuwangi in um, a two week uh, session. Um, however, due to the COVID restrictions after that, uh, we basically converted the business and pivoted into a marketplace and quality assurance company, where now we, be, uh, we distribute product directly to households and then at the same time um, directly to larger retailers, bigger um, oil and gas catering companies, restaurants, and retailers who buy more wholesale. Now we're definitely working on building out the infrastructure for the marketplace and the distribution whereby our products are certified quality. And then there's a verification step in terms of how we onboard farmers and the way that we monitor uh, food products moving in and out of the platform and into the hands of the consumers. Next, please. 
So really overall, I mean, throughout the changes that we've um, had to go through with Agron for the past few years, I think our value hasn't changed in terms of what we try to do um, on a day to day. We want to just see, you know, so much more efficiency in the way that farming um, is being done across small holder farmers by providing solutions such as mobile platforms to enable that efficiency and you know widespread information that can be shared. And at the same time, what we definitely hear from our farmers on the ground is that how can I improve my business? My business has not been doing well for a long time. I'm in a cycle of debt and I have so many things that I have to pay for. So hence that's what in a lot of the business um, that we're going into is really a focus on improving the farm ROI, looking at the, um, the farmer as a business and improving that information for them. And overall, you know, we're creating all this information about the farmers, about the ecosystem, suppliers, and we believe that we're building an agri-ecosystem that will enable every stakeholder involved in the supply chain to benefit through the data that's gathered, and that can be shared, that can be really elevating um, our entire ecosystem, especially in the agri tech industry. Next, please. Yeah, so basically that's uh, just a snapshot of where we are and who we are in terms of Agrom IQ. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, I just have a quick poll question to ask everyone. Um, I wanted to know which of the five business models that uh, we had mentioned before in the agri-tech landscape do you think has the highest potential to impact smallholder farmers' livelihoods and sustainability? Um, just to give a little bit of background, we noticed last year that uh, farmer advisory continues to be the category with the largest number of startups with digital marketplaces just behind. And um, right after this, I'm going to ask Vanessa a question uh, about maybe like the interaction between those two, because we definitely see a lot of interest um, in those two uh, business models, but they're not without their challenges. Um, obviously, Pranav, I think you can go ahead and end the poll. Thank you. Oh, so great. Clearly, everyone uh, is uh, thinking about farmer advisory uh, solutions. So I'm glad to see that you're, you're here uh, for this panel discussion. We have 20 minutes left, so let me just dive right into it. Um, Rasarid and Adam, could I trouble you to turn on your microphone, uh, sorry, videos again? And I'll just, I'll maybe start with Vanessa um, since you're already there. Uh, wanted to just ask you a question about how your uh, how Agrom IQ has been affected by the pandemic and kind of how did you react to that? Well, yeah, I think it, we were definitely affected um, a lot. I think we were on uh, we you know we had a plan of um, expansion into Indonesia and we were raising capital at the same time as well while um, during our expansion. And we had a pipeline of farmers that were all going through our training and they were all in large groups as well. And then we were onboarding um, all of these farmers at these events. So the moment um, that uh, COVID hit, everything basically shut down and we had to rethink, you know, we will not have, uh, let's say, you know, we won't be raising any capital and then we wouldn't have any revenue streams at all from our farm advisory or even our training. So I think it was, you know, it took a lot uh, from us uh, and from me as well to figure out, you know, what is the next step. And, you know, we took about a few weeks to really think about what is, uh, what's going to happen to us? Are we still going to exist? And I think uh, one of the, um, one of my mentors said to me, he said, you know, for the, far, for the businesses that don't matter, they will die. And the businesses that matter, they will survive. So they kind of like kicked me into gear and be like, okay, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And when we listen to the farmers and we go back to them, everyone was having difficulty in selling their products and they couldn't sell the supermarket. They weren't even allowed out. So we said, you know what, in two weeks time, we changed the entire business. We became logistic drivers. We built a platform in two weeks. We onboarded all the platform, uh, products that we had from our farmers and just started selling. And I think that was something that we did out of survival. But then it became something that to this day is grown into so much bigger and something that we've continued to build on. And yeah, so I think that that was kind of our experience of COVID. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing. Actually, there's a there's a comment in the chat that, that very much echoes this from Eureka, um, who said that uh, farmer orientation is fixed on market opportunities and also look looking to improve productivity by, I think you mean reducing excessive chemicals. Um, maybe I'm not sure, Rasarin, you have you have a view on that. Whether you actually see that there is um, 
interest from the farmers that you work with directly in uh, improving their sustainability and using less nitrogen-based uh, fertilizers. And then maybe if I can just tag on a question to that, uh, Bharati from Syngenta also asked you which are the most uh, preferred um, parts of uh, or functionalities of the app that farmers are, are interested in using. Okay. Um... I will answer for the, the most uh, feature that our farmer are using the most. Currently, we provide several features, right? Uh, first is the farm lock. Second is about the crop health analysis based on satellite and crop modeling about the water stress and the yield estimation. And the feature that we have been uh, monitored and see that the number of users are increasing and used more often is more on farm activity log. The reason that the farmer are using this because they want to use this feature to link with the certification. It's like, for example, the organic certification or like IFOM certification and a PTS certification with link to the community support farm management. And this also link to the part about the, the question that if farmer tend to use, the uh, reduce the fertilizer amount used in their farm or not. Based on this group of farmers, of course, yes. Farmers see that when they improve the productivity by looking at the quality of the soil and reduce the unnecessary use of fertilizer. This means that they can improve productivity. At the same time, they can uh, acquire the certification with the certification that can help them to open the opportunity to access to the better market, which means that it can help farmer to improve the the income. Right. Thanks. Um, I might actually just move quickly to a question for Adam uh, that came from one of the attendees here. Um, from sorry, I'm looking for it now. There was one I think maybe from Rick. Was it? Yes. Yes. Which I'm trying to look for now. So sorry, guys. I, 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 I saw Do you have it? One. Yes, thank you. Okay, I found it. It's from Rick um, who asked, um, how does the number and coverage of MNC dominated applications uh, relate to the number of startups? Uh, I think he means that we talk about in the, in the landscape. And if there's more bundling and takeovers to take place, what is the prediction of how many apps will survive and become dominant in the marketplace and in what segment slash type of services? Well, Okay, um, let's get out the crystal ball. But I, I think the question is a good one. Uh, and as Vanessa said, it, it is about uh, adapting and surviving. Uh, if the particular app is providing real value, uh, th then they will continue uh, to um, build their business. And I think there is a real distinction there. If it's too much of just an app business and not a real business model that's got you know depth um, that then there are chances that perhaps uh, the MNCs uh, who've got uh, more scale, more traction may be able to dominate. But at the same time, the MNCs know very clearly what they're good at and what they're not good at. And so I think it comes back to the startups working out how can they support the MNCs who still need to build scale. And perhaps it's in providing some fintech solution. Perhaps it's been very good at being on ground uh, building communities and uh, the micro entrepreneurs that I was talking about, the farm coordinators, those types of roles. So they're digital solutions that can be brought in there. And so they work with and grow with the MNCs rather than seeing a zero sum game. Thanks, Adam. And, and I think this also relates to something that is kind of mentioned, maybe not directly by both Vanessa and Rasarin, right? The importance of partnerships. Actually, you both have a lot of different types of partners, uh, agribusinesses, research organizations, um, cooperatives, I believe the government as well. And I just wanted to ask um, both of you if there have been any sort of like cross-cutting challenges that you faced in, in working with them when it comes to uh, making an impact on smallholder farmers. Uh, maybe I can ask Vanessa to go first. 
Sure. Yeah, I think definitely, um, especially in the field of agriculture, it's so vast and each country kind of has their own way of doing things. Partnerships are definitely very important in terms of understanding the farmers um, in this area. However, I think, um, I guess you're asking challenges, but I think most, most of the time we've felt we've had very good partners because we were very clear in communicating what, in communicating what we needed our partners to bring to the table. So let's say that when we were expanding into Indonesia, Indonesia uh, we were looking for a partner that had access to a farmer network. We would be providing the solutions and they will provide us the network. So in terms of that partnership, it went really well. And in terms of technical partnerships, we were able to communicate with our technical team. We basically uh, hired a technical team in Singapore to build out our um, in second phase of the mobile platform. And I think sometimes um, the communication is definitely important. Um, yeah, so in terms of challenges, yeah, I think uh, for us, we haven't necessarily felt like bigger challenges, but I think um, it's just really about clear communication and what you need from your partner that will be the key uh, mainstay for us as well. Thanks, Marissa. Um, Russell, and we also had a question, just on partnerships, someone just put a question in the, in the chat as well from Pierre. Paolo, uh, who asked if you could just expand a little bit on the partnership with Kubota, since I think he is looking at working with them in Cambodia. Ah, I see. So Kubota, right now, Kubota invests in recent field, and we also have a kind of agreement that we want to bring the solution that recent field are providing and developing to this region. And in Thailand, actually, before, before the investment, we have uh, what we call POC project together to bring this solution to support farmers in, in Thailand, especially for rice and for sugar cane. So they become like a uh, investor, uh, partner and customer for recent field. Thank you, thanks for sharing that. Um, there's another interesting question here uh, about the about the role you have or might have in improving agricultural extension services. I I think the the implication is that that's from the the government. I think this is uh, Radha Krishna's uh, question. Um, could I maybe put that to Vanessa? Yeah, sure. I think definitely that was the first focus uh, for Agrom as being that extension advisory service. What we saw on the ground was that uh, when a farmer did have a challenge, let's say a disease outbreak, or they saw some spots on the rice plant, they would sometimes basically have to collect that sample or send a photo to the agriculture officer in the department. And by the time they actually get to the farm, it'll maybe be five days or one week later for them to round circle back. So definitely with mobile solution with a basic app of just taking a photo and doing some analytics, um, a person from their uh, comfort of the office can basically provide some advisory quickly and then collect samples um, at a later date. At least what we saw was that with something like that, instead of 100% losses of a field, uh, which happened, um, we could actually reduce that and at least cover, um, you know, only 30% of that loss. I mean, 70% of it will not be lost. So that's just an example of how mobile platforms can provide a wide range of information. Yeah, thank you. And when we're looking at rice farms, it could be... Oh, yeah, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I think it froze. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and I think, um, let's say, um, with uh, rice farms that are across like 500 hectares, uh, what we saw on the ground was very quickly um, when a person got infected by a disease and they did not communicate uh, to the other partners or the farmers in their area, everybody was affected. So with the mobile platform, it was really just a broadcast message to everybody engaged on that same farming area to be aware. So then they can actually start um, applying chemicals so some people wouldn't even know about it. So that is an example of a farm extension advisory um, that is relevant uh, to what's happening now. Yeah. Yeah, may I ask a follow-up question that before I turn to Rasuin? So, I mean, a, a lot of people point out that in certain more isolated communities in, in Indonesia or Philippines, for example, you don't even have 3G connectivity to uh, for farmers to be able to download an app. So yeah. do you think these kind of messages are are can be delivered through 2G or uh, analog kind of simple phone sets? So we have a real-life example of this happening in Indonesia, whereby... Um, only 70, um, 30% of our farmers had mobile phones. So what we understood about the ecosystem is that every day there will be a farm head or a head of the uh, uh, Kuchamatan. 
whereby farmers would actually gather where information would be dispersed. So we don't o- allow the digital platform to be the inhibit- inhibitor in terms of the information. We have the information. Now it's about how do we relate that final mile information to the farmers. So we ensure that, oh, right, so we create a hierarchy of systems. There are farm workers, there's farm owners, farm managers. So in terms of the information, if the farmer doesn't have a mobile phone, and in Indonesia, it also seems as though they have multiple SIM cards and multiple phones based on your um, ideal conditions. So we felt that, yes, mobile application is definitely more of a privilege, but then the information is what is important here. So then we relay information in many different forms and what is comfortable for the farmers and when we try to overcome that in our onboarding sessions. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, Rasuri, I'll go back one question to the one about uh, improving agriculture extension services, maybe from Thai DOA or, or other interested parties, if, if Listen Field has ever considered that or something, you're, uh, a partnership you're, you're working on or just your thoughts. Yes, and actually, I do really agree with Vanessa on like the pet and disease uh, management. And based on this, we have a lot of interest from farmers and farming community. And we can see that the digital information that we collect that can really be contribute to prevent this kind of spread around. And at the same time, when we have the basic information on where the disease have found, we can analyze based on the information that we already have or the pattern of the climate, the, the soil condition or the pattern of the, the disease that have been moving around. This is the, the technology and information that can be extended and it can be very valuable for, for farmers to prevent the disease damage and at the same time reduce the chemical use in in this sense. Mm. I would like to um, pose a related question from Chris Wolf about how your your technology or your solution is actually changing ROI for farmers and how do you um, basically how do you measure this? And is it per farmer or like per group? Mm. If you could just share a bit more. At this moment we analyze that on the group of farmers. And it's like uh, the, the technology and the information that we provide, provide into individual farmers and to the group of farmers and to the meal or the organization that work with farmers. I will give some example. For example, right now we have one of the projects that we work with uh, the the uh, is, is it okay right, to mention the name? <laughs> is that you get support from, from one of the non-profit organizations and they provide us the opportunity to work with uh, smallholder farmers and these smallholder farmers produce rice that group with the uh, cooperative and cooperative send this rice to the, the meal and the exporter in this. So what we are trying to do is that we want to reduce the fertilizer amount used for smallholder farmer, which means that this is the ROI for, for smallholder farmer. If they can reduce the fertilizer amount used, but at the same time as the group, as the meal, the production should not be reduced. And this is the part that we also need to measure. And at the and for the, the, the agribusinesses, they also want to make sure that they can receive the production as they expected. It's more like all of the stakeholders should be benefit and ROI should be measured from the, the whole chain. And this is what we are doing. I see, thank you for sharing. Vanessa, do you want to add to that? the way that we measure ROI is as well why we focus a lot on improvement of quality through certification because what we see from our farmers when they get the certification they can at least now price their products at least double the price at which they were selling it for and they get directly the benefit of that uh, increased uh, price 
Um, but at the same time as well, what we definitely see in terms of our customers is that why we focus on higher value markets is that for smallholder farmers, when they don't have the right infrastructure, they sell to anybody and they basically sell it at a very low price in bulk, um, even before the season is fit, um, uh, done. So what we do is we aggregate these products as a, as a main bulk and we go to bigger supermarket chains and offshore companies that have that bigger spending power to buy quality and at the same time don't want to deal with so many farmers, um, although they still want their range of products. So what we're able to do with our platform, we aggregate all these products together and get a better deal for the farmers individually because they went on about, uh, we went to customers directly in terms of um, um, negotiating a better deal for them in terms of the price. And I guess at the same time as well, what we see as ROI is not just in terms of the dollar value, also in terms of payment terms, because some farmers, they only get paid after three months in terms of if they sell to a supermarket. What we do is we do lesser credit lines and at the same time, lesser demands in terms of if you do not hit that volume that you promised us, there will be no increased penalty or you're out of the chain for us. So we basically create more flexibility in our ecosystem to ensure that farmers will be able to continue to supply even when they do face challenges. Thanks, Vanessa. And thank you for clarifying your question further, Chris. I'm, I'm sorry, we, we can't dig more into the ROI question right now, because I'd just like to ask a final question before uh, we, we close. Um, I just want to shift gears a bit to a slightly different topic. Uh, it was a pleasant surprise for me that our panel ended up having two female startup founders because we didn't specifically target uh, to look for female startup founders for this panel, which is a, which is a good thing. And I think is, is, is what we want to aim towards, right? Diversity in a, in a panel discussion that's not about diversity. Um, so I was doing some research and I uh, found an ag funder report called Money Where Our Mouth Is that showed that only 7% of investment into agri-food tech in 2019 went to startups founded by women. 7%. Okay, that's, uh, I think, shockingly low. I, I just wanted to ask you both really quickly, um, have you experienced this gender bias at all? And how do you think the agri-tech startup community can support women startup founders? And I'm sorry, you only have half a minute each. Oh, oh one minute each, one minute each. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> Vanessa, I'll let you go okay. first. Okay, <laughs> definitely. Uh, we, if we're talking specifically uh, about gender bias and not just about the challenge of fundraising, I think definitely I've met a lot of different investors that basically question uh, the fact that I'm a female. That you know, why should you raise capital with you? Like, what if you have a kid? And you know, what if you don't want to do this business anymore? Will your husband approve? So very traditional, conventional mindsets uh, that also took me aback. And I think at the same time, um, that also inhibited uh, some uh, discussions because as well, when you think about agriculture, is a very, in a way, rural site areas. And there's a lot of the meetings and farmers that you have to meet is in rural areas. So in the initial early stages of um, the startup, definitely for women, it's more challenging when you go to all these rural areas and doing all these meetings and things like that and having this uh, network of farmers. And maybe as men, you may not realize this uh, certain uncertainty uh, and risk. Uh, but however, it was definitely uh, very challenging. And I hope that, you know, moving forward, there can be ecosystem enablers that do provide uh, more help, um, especially in this kind of area for these uh, kind of experiences that I've had. Thanks. Rosarina, over to you. Oh, for me, actually, fortunately, that I do not have uh, any experience on gen gentle bias. And I think for our region, is based on my my observation. I think in in our region, Southeast Asia region, female have a lot of good opportunity, and we can see a lot of uh, female leader, especially in Thailand. And I want to give one of example, the question that Japanese, Japanese like if you know that uh, Japanese uh, Japanese have a kind of some barrier for for female to be the leader. But for Japanese company, like when we work with Kubota, all the time Kubota always ask me that why why female farmers in Japan uh, in Thailand are so active. Whenever we organize the workshop, it's like eighty percent of farmers are female, and this is what I I observe. But I want to emphasize on that. I want to emphasize that we should give opportunity, not not based on uh, gentle. We should give a fair opportunity based on capability. And this is, should be the message that we should send to the investor to see the capability and to see the, the statistic that female 
female co-founder and female CEO can produce the better profit to the company. This is should be the message to send, and uh, the the investor should see this number. Yeah, thank you so much, Rosmin. So in a, in our gender program, actually, which is a bit separate from digital, we are also trying to make that business case for why um, being gender inclusive is actually good for your business. It's not just a CSR thing. It's not just something you should do from a moral perspective, even though there is that as well, but that, for, that there is a clear business case. So we are also in the process of trying to collect some of that data to make this point more clearly. Adam, do you want to say something? You would... no, I, I was just agreeing with you. Uh, the evidence is there both on the fact uh, that it's distributed proportionate in all VC investing, and also even more so in agriculture. But you're right, the studies show investing in women in agriculture will give you a positive return. So it's the way to go. Thanks, Adam. And on that note, I want to respect everyone's time. I, if uh, Please go ahead and launch the poll, Pranav. If you could just give us a little bit of feedback, that would be really helpful. Um, just want to know how useful this session was. Um, Pranav, you can go to the next slide, actually. Oh, sorry, JQ, you can go to the next slide while the polling is in progress. Yes, I just wanted to encourage you to um, join the Smallholder Agritech Southeast Asia LinkedIn group if you haven't already, um, and uh, let you know that we will send you the link to the Smallholder Agritech Landscape Report next week together with our digital newsletter, and the recording will be up on the Grow Asia DLS website soon. And um, I wanted to also let you know about the Grow Asia directory showcase that we are going to be launching in early May. So basically, we are going to be um, launching an open call for more tech startups um, that impact smallholder farmers in Southeast Asia to join our digital directory, which currently has about 70 agri-tech solutions already listed. And we are looking for sponsors to join us, particularly in shaping the business or industry challenges that we will use to shape the scouting process. So if you or your company are working with smallholders in the region and are interested to engage or re-engage with startups, please get in touch with me. And um, Yes, I think that brings us to the end of our session. I wanted to thank our our um, all our speakers, Adam, Rasserian, and Vanessa. Thank you so much for um, sharing your insights with us and uh, taking this time to um, yeah prepare for this. And I want to wish you all a good evening or a good day or a good morning, wherever you're calling us from in the world. And please join us at our next DLS in June. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, anyone whose uh, questions were not answered, um, you can also feel free to reach out, obviously, directly to the speakers who's, I think, probably put their emails there. Or um, please feel free to uh, email me as well directly if you like. Way, uh, my email's there, yes. Um, and we can maybe um, uh, engage with you a bit more on your questions. Thank you so much, everyone.